a little bit more about this session. Uh, Kier and I came up with the, the basic premise for it. We were deeply inspired by an Afro-Caribbean revolutionary thinker named Franz Fanon, whom I, who I dare say has been very important to our respective political development. Fanon famously said that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission um, and fulfill it or betray it. And we understand that statement to very much apply to the crucial question of decolonizing education. Uh, in recent years, we've seen numerous young people around the world answer Fanon's call for action when confronting intensifying social, political, economic, and ecological crises. This interactive panel is meant to consider how the lived experiences and perspectives of our featured youth organizers across the Global South uh, and at the margins of the Global North can help us to reimagine education altogether. Um, our panelists are going to foreground various approaches to decolonial education and the victories and challenges they have experienced in the course of the excellent and incredibly important work that they have been doing. The entire purpose of this conversation is to try and imagine shared pathways forward for decolonial education and educators involved with it. Among other things, we would like this panel to confront the widespread co-optation of the ideas and rhetoric of decoloniality by mainstream educational institutions. If you go to just about any American college or university that is even nominally liberal these days, you're likely to hear several land acknowledgements in the course of your time there. Uh, as as much as a lot of indigenous and racially oppressed communities have fought to include these land acknowledgements in institutional programming, these institutions have taken advantage of these acknowledgements to actually inhibit rather than promote uh, material decolonization. And so we want this panel to recenter the continual re-envisioning of knowledge sharing in communities around the world that are resisting the prevailing colonial, imperial, and capitalist world system. I have briefly stated the names and affiliations of our esteemed panelists. I would like to now give them the chance to introduce themselves while telling us a little more about how they situate themselves and their work in the overall field of education. I should say at this point, as I was saying to folks who were on the call a little earlier, that Ariel Luwa is actually in the air at the moment. He had to take a flight uh, at the exact same time as this call. And so we will be limited to sharing a video response from him pertaining to the questions that will guide this discussion. Um, I will play that in just a bit. But in the meantime, I would like to invite Kier to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about their work and how it is located within the overall field of education. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so my name is Kier Blake. I use they, them pronouns. I am a light brown skinned black non-binary person of Jamaican American heritage and I have a afro with hair on the side shaved and I'm wearing a black and white um, speckled turtle shirt. I am the co-founder of uh, Start Empowerment as well as the director of community and school partnerships located on unceded and occupied Lenape Kanarsi Munsi territory and Currently, the gap we feel in education, both in Start Empowerment and also in my work in the field, um, is through introducing concepts like environmental racism, explaining the cross-section between race and environments that people are situated in, and how these usually um, result in dis disparate um, environmental harms. 
um, as well as um, going a step further by centering political environmental education in our work as a critical tool in the metaphorical toolkit for fighting liberation. And we do this by high quality social environmental justice, education, and programming. Um, I have a lot of different experiences of traveling around the world. Um, when putting together this panel with Pratik, I was very fascinated by hearing from a lot of the youth that are a part of the Ecoversities Alliance and also allied with the Ecoversities Alliance and really wanted to also um, touch upon that um, here today. So later on, I'll definitely touch upon that. I study nonprofit and collective organizational management and development at NYU, and I currently am a master's of science candidate in the environmental policy and sustainability management program at the new school, and currently studying decolonial education frameworks for youth empowerment. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for introducing yourself, Kier. Adi, thank you like so much for introducing yourself, Kier. Yeah, sure. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Addy Lenster. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a student from Vermont, from Middlebury College. I'm currently an undergraduate student studying sociology, um, and I am the founder of the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network, which is a group of students in Vermont, which is on Mohican territory. Um, that works to promote anti-racism in our schools. So we create lesson plans and host event events, and we have written legislation, um, and we do a lot of work to try to promote anti-racism in our schools and our communities. And we also do a lot of work around the school to prison pipeline and dismantling structures that are um, unjust and oppressive towards students of color, especially in students with disabilities. Um, and I also work with Our Turn, which is a national education nonprofit here in the United States. And we do a lot of work around just mobilizing um, students of color and allies um, to just um, promote education justice in around the country. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with you all today. Thank you so much for that introduction as well, Addy. Um, and thank you both for keeping our introductions brief as much as you could say a whole lot more about uh, your organizations and the incredible work that you have been doing. Uh, needless to say, we will get to that work very soon. As a matter of fact, almost immediately. Before we do so though, I guess it falls upon me to introduce Ariel Uwa, seeing as he cannot join him uh, join us himself. Uh, Eriolua Adeinka, who uses he him pronouns, is an educator and development practitioner with operational experience working on various education and development projects with social businesses, NGOs, and the Nigerian government, both in Nigeria as well as in other parts of the world. He is the executive director at Youth by Youth, where he engages and supports young people across multiple continents, and especially in three regional hubs in Africa, namely in Nigeria, Uganda, and Cameroon. Uh, Ariolua also co-founded a community-based organization in Nigeria that is reimagining education through teacher training, curriculum development, and capacity building. Um, he consults for a number of educational organizations, specifically nonprofits and startups in his spare time. His overall mission, as he envisions it, is to build and develop sustainable education systems in Africa. I wish he could be here to tell you all this himself, as I'm sure he could add a lot more texture to this description. Uh, we did, however, give Arialua the chance to respond as he saw fit to the questions that will be guiding our discussion. And I'd actually like to kick off our discussion by playing this brief video response from him, after which I will begin facilitating the dialogue between Kier, Addy, and all of you, if that sounds good, folks. All right, let me go ahead and make sure I'm sharing my sound so that you can hear what Ariel Lua has to say. Uh, if you have any technical issues, just let me know. Hopefully uh, that will not be the case. Here's Ariel Lua responding to the overarching themes and the more specific questions guiding this panel. 
Hello everyone, my name is Eriolu Adink and I'm so happy to be on this panel with Care, Pratik and Hadi. I'm so glad because we get to talk about something very, very important that matters so much to me and the work that I do. Before I proceed into uh, why I, I am making this video, my name is Eriolu Adink once again. I am the current executive director at an organization called Youth by Youth, which is a movement of young people supported by adult allies radically reimagining the future of education and today i want to talk about what education what decolonizing education means to me as somebody who lives in the global south currently nigeria i know that decolonizing education is something that is a big subject to everybody it's something that really concerns everybody in the global south especially people who who just got their independence recently or got their independence some decades ago because of our education and because of the kind of education that i've experienced and the kind of education that i've experienced throughout my entire um, academic journey even though i'm still learning and unlearning i can fully say that decolonizing education means giving people the ability to choose so giving people the freedom and the power to choose is what decolonizing education means to me and this can only be achieved if people are allowed to design the kind of education that they want the kind of education that they want to see which is actually influences one of the some of the work that i do in at youth by youth which is radically reimagining what that future of education is imagine we didn't have all of these barriers imagine we didn't have the oppressive system of schooling imagine young people had the choice to pick what they want to learn to choose how they want to learn and where they want to learn and when they want to learn that is exactly what we mean by decolonizing education and this can only be learned through the power of choice and i've been able to achieve this by a couple of programs and also supporting other young people in various parts of the world to do that currently in nigeria i currently co-lead an, an organization that supports teachers to allow them give the power to their students to choose how they want to learn where they want to learn and also decolonize that process and design education in such a way that it serves everyone one of the things that we do at youth by youth is to ensure that learning is serves everyone in everywhere and in every place that they have currently in uganda we have people who have been part of our programs like Charles, because we have a physical hub in uganda where people do a lot of reimagining of education there we have people like Charles or Moyet, a campus secret who have been doing a lot of work in decolonizing education in allowing educators in that environment understand what it means to actually have an education or a form of learning that serves everybody and i feel like learning should serve everyone i strongly believe that learning should serve everyone it is only when learning serves everybody from the global south that is indeed when we can actually decolonize learning and i need us to ask our question what is our own form of learning what is our own education everything that we know right now we need to begin to question it we need to begin to question the systems we need to begin to hold our systems and our institutions accountable and i think that we've been successful because we started from a small group of just about 50 people to a community now of about 1,000 young people who have participated in our various programs, radically reimagining what education would look like. And I think that's a, that's a huge success, right? We've, 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 we've grown from having about 20 participants in our programs to having hosts, people who are willing to host programs, people who are willing to host conversations, stakeholder engagements to ensure that the learning that we are currently experiencing is being decolonized. And I think that's just the beauty of ensuring that everybody is willing to radically reimagine that future of education. And I think that we all as young people need to begin to ask ourselves, this current education and this current system, is this why it is is this how it is meant to be? What are the things that I can begin to do right now that will change? Do I have the power to choose? The moment the power to choose and the freedom of learning is not there, then that means there is a lot of colonization and, op and oppression. And we need to reimagine that to decolonize that learning because learning should be a thing of choice. You should be able to choose how you want to learn. You should be able to choose what you want to learn. You should be, learning is supposed to serve you. 
So if you live in an environment or in a space where learning doesn't serve you, or learning doesn't serve the purpose it's supposed to serve, then I'm, then, then, then I'm afraid that you should stand up, be a part of this panel, join forces together with organizations like Youth by Youth and the things that Care and Practice are doing, and ensure that you support this decolonization of education because it's affecting us. Even in the global north, we see the way the public schools were designed, you know, for the minority groups, you know, um, people who had gone through slavery and all of those things. The public schools were designed in a way to allow them to have some, system, some way of thinking. You know, you cannot aspire to a certain level because of, because it has been designed to colonize your mind, to cage your mind. Even the way students sit in the classrooms. These are various things that we are beginning to decolonize as an organization is by to say, okay, we don't want to sit in the classroom anymore for classes. Students don't want to sit in the classroom to learn. They want to learn with nature. They want to learn in their ecosystem. They want to learn in different places. And I think that this challenges everybody to begin to think about the systems that they are currently in and the systems that they are faced with, the institutions that they are surrounded with. Hello, everyone. My name is Eriolu. Because students don't want to sit in the classroom to learn. They want to learn with nature. They want to learn in their ecosystem. They want to learn in different places. And I think that this challenges everybody to begin to think about the systems that they are currently in and the systems that they are faced with, the institutions that they are surrounded with, and how they would like to decolonize the systems of oppression around them. Let's rise up and fight all the oppressions and injustices that are faced with our learning. And I'm very sure that at the end of the day, it's going to work for our collective liberation. Thank you very much for having me and let me know if you have any questions. Uh, in case you twigged a little bit as I was playing that video, yes, I did accidentally restart it right, right as it was, it was about to conclude, but uh, I managed to get it back on track. Um, I'm very glad that uh, Ariel Uwa's voice can be part of this conversation, even if he can't virtually be here to contribute to it. I think that this video, brief as it might be, um, stands to frame our conversation in really productive ways, in no small part by directing our attention to how coercion is baked into the very bones of so much hege hegemonic education in different parts of the world. Keeping that in mind, I would like to open up the conversation um, to Kier, Adi, and everyone else in the room with a rather straightforward question uh, that might actually be deceptively simple, though I trust uh, my esteemed panelists to provide substantive responses to it. The question is simply, what does decolonizing education mean to you? Kier, would you like to kick us off? Thank you. Um, so yes. Um, so when you said deceptively simple, I just thought of the Tuck and Yang's um, iconic work, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, um, where they clearly state in their abstract that decolonization brings about the repatriation or rematriation of indigenous land and life, and it is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. So decolonization in education to me cannot happen apart from indigenous land sovereignty and autonomy. And for my work with Start Empowerment and on the other organized projects I do, I'm always now constantly thinking about that in the back of my head. How are my relationships um, being tied to um, indigenous struggles, indigenous, indigenous autonomy, um, indigenous sovereignty, um, and self-governance. And so I think to um, what Ariola said as well, like when you're now first, that first step has come about, right? In addition to all of that, right? Giving people the ability to choose, right? to choose how they'd like to be educated, to choose a pathway, a pathway or a framework, um, to be able to determine like what their own education looks like and also holding our institutions accountable. Um, because I feel that, and you know, I can always expand upon this later, um, 
what I found in the space is kind of just everything kind of falling on this spectrum from maybe deinstitutional to more decolonial. Deinstitutional meaning that perhaps the aim is to decolonize, but maybe fall short of that truly liberatory goal of seeing like intersectional liberation amongst all peoples and land back to decolonial, which would look like that ideal end goal based on, you know, current conditions, right? Not forgetting dialectics, but, um, you know, dealing with and trying to advocate and work towards and achieve land back um, and liberation for all. So that's pretty much my answer. Thank you so much for bringing land into the conversation here. Uh, to return to Fanon for just a second, he very famously described decolonization in general as the reclamation of land and bread. And I think that as we proceed with this conversation about decolonizing education, we would do well to keep that broad, but also very pointed definition of decolonization in general in mind. I'd like to now turn it over to you, Addy, um, to tell us a little bit more about how you understand decolonizing education. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Kira, for that um, really good answer. I, I think for me, so I'm like um, based in the U.S., so my answers are going to be pretty centric around the U.S., but um, for me, it really starts with like the curriculum that we learn. Um, I think the curriculum that we currently learn in the U.S. is very Eurocentric um, and very centered on like the story of colonialism and just white people. And I think that needs to change. We need to be including the perspectives of Black Americans, Indigenous Americans, like everybody, um, and be hearing from all perspectives equally and be hearing a really true comprehensive history that comes from all perspectives. And I think that's kind of where my mind first goes um, when I think of decolonial education, but I think um, there are also a lot of other aspects to it too, including like um, how schools are structured. You know, it's very, um, it's very strict how schools are currently structured. Like if you think of just the school day, how it's laid out, it's not, it's not very structured in humanity and like what what young people need. Um, and like Kier was kind of saying, or I think someone mentioned before, like about the environment, like um, I think students should be able to, if they're interested, like study in the environment, do whatever, um, whatever they're passionate about and school should be more centered on what students care about um, so that they are able to grow up and like know what they wanna do and have a background in studying things that interest them. Um, so I think the whole structure of school needs to change. And also school discipline is very rooted in racism um, and just inequities for students in general. Um, and I think we definitely need to work on like school resource officers and different aspects of school that are just very um, inequitable. So that's kind of like a long-winded answer, but it's kind of all of those things um, in a compilation. Thank you for that response, Adi. Um, I, I'm actually quite glad that you're going to be focusing on uh, the public school system in this country um, in no small part, because I think that's uh, uh, an area of concern for a lot of folks on this call. And in a more general sense, because as um, Kali Akuno of uh, Cooperation Jackson said during um, an online conversation, nothing about the uh, American empire is strictly domestic. Uh, just think about how the military industrial complex has infiltrated the school system in this country. It is very actively recruiting young people who are disproportionately from poor working class and racially oppressed backgrounds to kill the targets of American imperialism overseas. I mean, I think that alone makes the public school system here a very crucial site of intervention for critical and radical educators. Needless to say, it is also very much under attack from reactionary forces in this country, who I think were terrified by the George Floyd rebellion that occurred in the summer of 2020 and want to go out of their way to prevent anything of the sort from ever happening again. Keeping all of these crucial concerns in mind, I'd, I'd basically like to hear your uh, decolonial educational origin stories, if you will. 
you know, both of you have rather sophisticated approaches to decolonial education. And I think we'd all love to hear a little more about how you developed those approaches. Uh, to put it simply, how did you, the, the, the two of you come to the concept and praxis of decolonial education? Thank you. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I think for me, I mean, Start Empowerment started, you know, pretty much back in 2017 when Alexi and I first met, but really formalized in 2019 and then it became, you know, a formal, an even more formalized, governmentally recognized, whatever, <laughs> organization um, in 2021. So like this was a long process. And, you know, as I aforementioned, we first started off just seeing that, you know, um, not a lot of people were talking about um, environmental justice or talking about environmental racism. Um, for us, it was really important that people understood environment um, in relation to all the other types of social injustices that were going on, um, not to um, understate or underrate those other social injustices, but also to more... Um, to increase um, more integration of these kinds of topics into different, you know, community spaces, organizing spaces, um, classrooms, etc. Um, and so, you know, like, as you said, uh, Pratik, you know, it was, you know, then in, in, in 2020, right, with the George Floyd uprising um, in the so-called U.S., that more and more, like, American higher educational institutions slash schools were then approaching us about saying, hey, you have this curriculum, um, let's just check off this box and like introduce your curriculum. Um, of course, they didn't say it like that, but like that was generally the gist. Um, and so we kind of just were in this space where we're just like, okay, obviously this is a need, right? So like, how do we take this forward in a way where we're, you know, as Addie was mentioning, introducing other types of histories, other types of voices, things like that, that we'd already been doing, but taking it a step further. Um, Cause for us, like, decolonization is a noun yes but it's also a verb and so it's like how can we get students like how can you further politicize students and get students to understand um their own uh sense of agency right as um Eriolua mentioned but also their own sense of empowerment and their ability to actually create change right where they are um and not so much you know having to do protests even though yes that is great and amazing but also what does that look like in other contexts within like, you know, providing care, um, you know, working towards like community food sovereignty, um, you know, uh, working on, um, you know, opening spaces um, and advocate, advocating for the lessening of policing of like their schools, right? So as Addy mentioned, right, the school to prison pipeline and also um, punishment intersecting with like, you know, inherent racism in educational institutions. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say, you know, over time, we started to think more critically about that. And we have even started to implement that into curriculum and then also into student projects. Um, so students lead our projects and we um, develop grant and funding and um, school budgets around that. Um, and we follow um, Up for Learning's uh, Youth Adult Partnership Roadmap to Agency, which I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but we do a lot of that. We also do a lot of organizing. So students um, learn or learn about first um, environmental and food justice, and then have the opportunity to start their own community projects, um, which we help to mentor them on around. Um, and we also work with school administration to also think about the sustainability and overall accessibility and care offered by the school. So most of our school partnerships have lasted years um, because we really, really want that to be a long-term process where we're not only changing students' lives, but we're changing the actual fabric of the schools. And lastly, um, I guess like the kind of new frontier that we're kind of embarking on is, you know, what does it look, now look like, right? Understanding decolonization is not a metaphor. The end goal is land back. Um, how do we further these relationships with um, indigenous communities and nations um, in and around like the schools that we work in and just, you know, within New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area, because, you know, as you know, displacement. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely that's just a snapshot. 
I absolutely love your framing of decolonization as a verb, not just a noun, thereby identifying it as a necessarily ongoing process. It has to be an ongoing process, among other things, just to address the entrenchment of colonialism and imperialism within the field of education and in every other field in this part of the world. And we're essentially talking about addressing 500 years of violence in numerous forms. And so that process is going to be an extended one, which of course should not prevent anyone, especially young people from engaging in it. Over to you, Addy. Um, thank you. So I think, well, how I got involved in this work initially was just from my own experience being in the public school system and seeing you know, the education that we received wasn't, I mean, it just wasn't inclusive. It wasn't an anti-racist. So um, I wrote, I, I wrote a bunch of superintendents across the state of Vermont um, and asked them like, hey, what are you doing um, about anti-racism in education? Um, and I got a lot of responses, but there really wasn't any, you know, movement that came from that. So I decided to start um, the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network and um, we got together, it was just a few of us on Zoom because it was during COVID. Um, and we started, we applied for some grants and got some money to purchase anti-racist picture books for elementary schools. And um, we went into classrooms and read them with kids and taught them lessons about anti-racism and history and inclusivity. Um, so that was like our first thing. And I mean, it's it's kind of grown over the past three years. and. Um, since 2020, we've been in over 30 classrooms across Vermont. So we're really bringing these lessons to the youngest kids because we feel like if we're able to get those kids into anti-racist habits early on, that will stick into adulthood. And then they'll become, you know, we'll have a better society as a whole. So um, that's kind of how I got into it. And now we have you know, we just had an event last year with over um, 300 students attending at the Vermont State House, which was really cool just to see how, um, how like students are interested in this stuff and they care about it. It's just school doesn't always provide an outlet for that. Um, so that's what we try to do. And um, thank you so much, Addy. Um, rather handily, given the, the limited time we have to work with, both of you have already started answering the, the next question that I have, which is namely, uh, how have you tried to decolonize education through your work um, and through your organizing? Um, as such, I'd like to club that question with the next question on my list and basically invite both of you to say a little more about the specifics of your work around decolonizing education, as well as the successes that you've had and the challenges you have faced in the course of your work. Over to you, Kier. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so I would say that, I mean, so, I mean, you're showing the slide with Start Empowerment's work. Um, and then also some of the um, in independent work that I'm also starting to embark on. Um, as I mentioned, building more relationships for like long-term organizing with different indigenous groups. So in this case, we had um, indigenous groups um, um, who are Borican um, Tainos from, so then therefore indigenous people from um, so-called Puerto Rico and also um, members of the Rosebud um, Nation um, that's like located in the Midwest, as well as also um, the Ramapo Lenape Nation. So that's uh, based in New Jersey. And as you can see, uh, the classrooms don't really look like classrooms, but people are doing learning in these spaces. Um, and for me, it's like actually, again, really important to bring it back to land. Like people should be able to like learn, um, convene, have fun. Um, in outdoor spaces, um, do like more collective activities, cook together, laugh together, paint together, create together. Um, because really what I see decolonization really being is obviously, right, imagining what a future can look like and then working together to actually implement it, right? I think a lot of times some of the challenges is that I see in the space is that 
will often get um, so bogged down in the intellectualism of decolonization um, and even like kind of feeling maybe even a bit afraid to like mess up um, that we might not act. And I think that's a really big thing that we try to instill in our students and that, you know, we're all going to have to be accountable to each other. We can always engage critique and self-critique of the things that we're doing, but we should always, again, um, be in action, be in the verb, embody decolonization in everything that we're doing. Um, and so like on the right, you can see um, students in a classroom um, that are engaging in hydroponic gardening. Um, this was because we had to shift the actual boxed gardening and rooftop gardening to indoors as the school was in construction. But basically, we were able to harvest at least 25 pounds of greens before the school went on for the summer, which then we were able to distribute to students um, and then to other faculty because turns out they were actually pretty yummy. Um, and so you can see that in the little baggies that we're holding. That's just from one harvest, too. Um, that's not even all of it. Um, and so, yeah, like just kind of teaching how to grow even more nutritious veggies right where you are, too, like, um, you know, in an urban environment. Um, in a highly densely populated environment um, with very limited resources. And so that's also what's important to us. Um, and another way that we've been trying to work to, de to decolonize is by implementing political um, environmental justice education. And so you can see in the middle on the top, you can see just a snapshot of some of the youth vanguards that we have um, or youth organizers. We're also working on the name and like um, relaunching the program. Um, but essentially it's, you know, meeting students meeting students, meeting youth where they're at. A lot of them are, you know, ending their time in high school, entering into college. Um, and again, we're continuing to work with them on their community-based projects. We're continuing to push them and challenge them, um, challenge their praxis um, and challenge um, their own methodologies and frameworks to ensure that, again, they're always um, thinking through what they're doing, thinking through whether it's tied to community, how they can better, um, better their own organizing and their own action. Um, and so, you know, amazingly, Isa, which is on the top right, just won a grant for $5,000, for example. Ade has, you know, um, started to speak on more international platforms recently, the United Nations and Kwaku on the bottom um, left was a huge part of the Earth Month Convergence for which all the photos on the left-hand side are a really big part of. Um, Mars um, on the bottom second from the right um, is a huge part of Fridays for Future New York City and Kai um, on the bottom second from the left um, is currently in Uganda um, creating children's books to further climate literacy as well as just overall children's literacy. Um, so again, really amazing, amazing youth um, that are already doing really great things. Just again, employing that empowerment variable, right? obviously giving them the tools, the understanding, the terminology, and then helping them to create that change and supporting them just by furthering um, that mentorship and that long-term support. So yeah, I would say that's kind of <laughs> just a snapshot again of how we've been kind of decolonizing um, in our work. I will once again express my appreciation for your attentiveness to the politics of space and place as part of getting beyond uh, decolonization as a solely intellectual endeavor. Um, Fanon, um, among many other decolonial thinkers, very much describes decolonization as a process of creating new people altogether. That's how he concludes his famous manifesto, The Wretched of the Earth by speaking of the new human beings who will be born through the process of decolonization as it engages both colonized populations as well as colonizer populations. Um, I, I'm sure I could ramble on about the subject, but I'll stop myself and hand it over to Addy to address this question about the specifics of her work and the successes and challenges that she has encountered. Yeah, well, it's hard to follow up on your care because what you said was amazing. But um, I think what I explained a little bit before about the book project, that's our biggest thing. Um, we're going into elementary school classrooms, reading with students and doing lessons with them. And 
we've had a lot of really positive feedback from both parents and teachers and also students themselves. You know, we've had conversations where we start with like a classroom of kindergartners and we ask, what is race? And they say, uh, is it when someone's mean to you because of your gender? And we're like, okay. But like, you know, we're able to then talk with them and like get them to understand these difficult concepts. And by the end of it, they were talking about it and understanding it. And that's just a really huge success for us. Um, and oh yeah, also here are some pictures of a virtual lesson and then an in-person lesson. Um, and the one on the right, we were having them make protest signs because we were talking about protesting and what issues they care about. Um, so that's what that picture is. Um, so that's like our biggest thing. We also have worked with um, high school and middle school a lot too. Um, so we, if any of you know the book, um, Color of Law or The New Jim Crow, those are two books that we've worked around. One is about housing segregation and discrimination. And one is about um, like um, the criminal justice system. And we try to bring those into schools um, to get students talking about these issues. Um, of like anti-racism, inclusivity, um, equity, and also decolonization. Um, so that's like the biggest thing that we do, but we also have the Day of Racial Equity, which is here. Um, and we had a lot of students come to the State House and participate in workshops with like people from the NAACP and the ACLU, which are a bunch of big organizations um, in the US. And on the right is a picture of a speaker from Bernie Sanders' office. If any of you know who he is, he's like a famous Vermont Senator. Um, so she came and spoke, which was really cool. Um, so that was also a really big success. But in terms of challenges, um, it has been difficult. Um, we've done some legislative work too. Oh, and also we did a big report on um, racial equity. So we talked about like housing discrimination, health care, um, um, criminal justice system, all sorts of inequities. And just one of them that really stuck with me is that Black Vermonters are six times more likely to be right. in prison than white Vermonters, um, which is just something that I think is really important to focus on. So that's what we did with this report. Um, but in terms of challenges, we um, we worked on legislation and we had to talk to a lot of people who didn't necessarily agree with our views. Um, and not that that was a challenge because actually it was it was a good conversation and like we we found a lot of common ground with people, but we also had a lot of points of disagreement, um, especially with adults from like, yeah, just like adults who are more um, conservative than our group. Um, so we had to work with that. And in advocating for that bill, we had to deal with also legislators who didn't necessarily agree with our views around equity, um, especially with all of the like anti-CRT stuff going on. Like we were kind of right in the middle of that. Um, so that was definitely a challenge, but we also try to pair that with successes and we just try to keep moving forward to promote this education as much as we can. Thank you so much, Adi. Uh, let me say that uh, the work that you and your comrades are doing uh, requires no small amount of bravery. The right in this country is increasingly um, devolving into straightforward neo-fascism. Um, a lot of, of prominent uh, conservative talking heads are essentially preaching fascism in one sense or another. You can very much see that with the concerted attacks on trans, queer, and non-binary people happening across the country, including in regions such as California or New York, for that matter, that are considered more progressive. Um, racism is the very bedrock of this country as a whole. And so it is rearing its ugly head just about everywhere, not just in the, the Southern states that you hear so much about, such as Texas. Um, and I will say that it's not only rearing its ugly head in and of itself, but it is fusing with other forms of reaction, such as transphobia, queerphobia, homophobia, and misogyny, with a view towards cultivating full-blown fascism with the aid of the now uh, ever increasingly right-wing Supreme Court in this country. Um, all of which means that the work that you folks are doing comes as an, at an absolutely crucial juncture. Um, in this country's contemporary history as a whole. Um, 
speaking of that history and connecting it to the present for the purposes of imagining the future, uh, I wanted to ask you folks what you think um, a decolonial educational future might look like. How do you imagine um, a truly decolonial educational system um, being cultivated in the present so as to truly empower future generations wherever it is implemented? Kier, would you like to kick us off? Yes. Um, so for me, when I think of a decolonial future, I guess I think of um, recently, so I, I'm a, currently a master's of science student in environmental policy and sustainability management at the new school school in this in the so called US specifically in New York City. Um, and I have been looking at um, uh, the school um, in Chiapas um, that was uh, kind of like started by like the the Zapatistas. Um, I'll put the the link in the chat right now. Um, but you know, in particular, um, I really like the way that they um, are really attentive to the holistic um, individual. Um, not just students, but just adults in general, because, right, like, no one is self-made, everyone is community-made, um, and I would also like to think that, you know, no, no child, right, raises themselves, right, it's the community that raises them, and so they have, like, a really um, intentional way of also tying in women's empowerment, right, who they can um, partner with, um, what access they do they have to, like, higher wages, things like that, but then also looking at like the food, right? Are kids getting fed in school, things like that. It's very like also, again, reminiscent of the Black Panther Party, but also different, right? Because we have to also think about dialectics, meaning what is the material reality of the people in that society look like, right? And so, yeah, like I also think of like the Black Panther Party, right? Like how they also had all of these like survival programs, like free breakfast programs, um, transportation programs, um, health programs, like they even had like some of the first clinics to start testing for HIV and things like that. So I, I guess what I see is like something less institutionalized than what New York City currently has with their community schools. Um, that's maybe the closest I see it to being, except it still is very hard to become a community school provider or third party um, organization that works with schools. I think the fact that, right, we have to be a nonprofit to even work with schools is like institution, like as a, is a, is, is a semblance of like the institutionalized um, mechanism that like bars people from, right, like being educators, right? Like in decolonial ed contexts, no one gets a certificate, right, to teach kids, like, you know, like you might have certain like experiences or certain backgrounds, right? But you don't need to go like to a four-year university and then get a master's like program and maybe even a PhD, right? Like it's just understood that your personal experience, your personal history, right? Um, and obviously your success or, you know, however is deemed um, a value, right? Is for that community is like, is enough. Um, and so like, I just kind of am thinking about like, perhaps if, if it's easier to imagine, maybe just a better, um, like a, a twist off of like the community school model where um, an organization, you know, may provide like therapy or counseling or food supports, right? In addition to classes that are taught and they will also bring in extra activities and speakers and things like that. So students can actually have more out of classroom experiences, um, but yeah. and. I guess like really quickly, I also just did really wanna quickly cover um, the fact that um, in decolonization is not a metaphor. Tuck and Yang also talk about like a lot of like the pitfalls of like innocence. Um, I think a lot of times when we're talking about like decolonization, I find that so many people find ways to kind of wriggle out of like accountability. Um, but again, <laughs> decolonization is land back. Like that's like point blank period. Um, so like settler nativism, right? Like claiming like distant native ancestry, right? Or native descent, right? To avoid facing guilt, um, reinforces the ideas of innocence um, and retains 
claim to land and wealth without like thinking about how to redistribute that. Um, you know, for example, I see that with a lot of white, white passing people, um, fantasizing adoption. So like, um, you know, I make no judgment on who native or indigenous peoples decide to adopt um, into their tribes. But I do see a lot of times people learning cultures, languages, and customs um, pertaining to like you know, indigeneity and things like that, and using that as a way to say, oh, I've done the work, but I don't need to give up land. Um, you know, a colonial equivocation, right? Like, also, like, the blending of experiences of oppression um, as colonized peoples, right? Like, um, again, not playing the oppression Olympics, um, but also understanding the nuance in terms of relationship to settler colonialism is something that's really big, I think, in a lot of um, people of color spaces, and I think needs to be talked about, especially in relation to coalition politics. Um, conscientization, um, basically you can't like just learn about decolonization, you have to do it. Um, and then just more things around like, okay, yeah, like let's go back to, to living on the land, right? But again, it's like land back, right? At the end of the day, we have to like land back. Um, and we also need to make sure that, right? Like we're also doing our utmost to describe um, to go to move away from describing indigenous peoples as extinct as what can be seen in the Caribbean with the Taino peoples or on the verge of extinction, um, where a lot of my students um, have no clue that there are indigenous peoples like living amongst them. Um, so I just wanted to kind of add that really quickly. I know that I'm in the right company when someone organically brings up not only the Zapatistas, but the Black Panthers as well. Thank you for that incredibly rich response, Kiar. Over to you, Addy. Um, yeah, so I guess I would start by saying, I think there are a lot of things that are politicized that shouldn't be. Um, like the fact, like even students just getting meals and like things and and um, and um, doctor like care and stuff like that. Like it, it, that should just be a given. Like students should have that, young people should have that. And so I think when I envision what the future looks like, I think like here kind of said, like the community school model is definitely very interesting. And I think we need to make schools more centered on just like the whole student and like who, what individualized education that allows students to pursue what they're passionate about. Um, and I think if we want, if we're talking about decolonized education, I think it's not only history, but just the way that we do school as a whole that needs to change um, just because of the way that how the current world is and the current education system is is so tied to America's history and the history of the world. Um, so I think the future in an ideal world would look like, you know, understanding the past and accepting that we all have a part to play in making change, no matter what race we are, who we are, like we all have a part to play. And that includes white people. And as a white person, like, I think it it comes along with a responsibility to get other white people into the work. Um, so I think that, you know, when I envision the future, I envision just people, you know, understanding that, um, understanding the history and how we got to where we are and um, trying to make a school that's more centered on just the whole child and equity and um, inclusivity. And um, of course, like dismantling oppressive structures such as like the discipline system and things like that. Um, so I think there's a lot that goes into it, but that's kind of how I envision the future. Thank you for your attentiveness to the basic needs of food and healthcare, which very much go hand in hand with the basic right to education. And I think that identifying these basic needs and putting them in conversation with what Kiara is saying about land back, once again, it forces us to recognize decolonization in the expansive and intensive terms um, in which Fanon framed it. You know, Fanon described decolonization as a program that sets out to change the order of the world. Um, taken to its logical conclusion, decolonization necessarily involves turning the entire world upside down. Um, which is profoundly frightening to the powers that be, um, which should you know, make us think critically about the importance of critical 
practical political education to struggles in the imperial court of the US, but also around the world. Uh, just a quick time check, it is now 6.02, uh, 6.03 rather, um, and this session is scheduled to conclude at 6.30. We want to make sure that we have enough time uh, to have uh, a robust and hopefully fruitful dialogue with our audience. Uh, I, I, I have just one more question on my list about why effective decolonial education should, ex should engage the experiences and perspectives of young people such as yourselves. Uh, Pierre and Addy, would you like to tackle this question or should we um, set it aside for now and then head into our audience discussion? Maybe circling back to it at some point during that discussion. I, I mean, I think we kind of, I think we both touched upon it, but just really quickly, just to answer this question, I think that children should be our guiding star. I think that they don't think right like the more that we grow up in this world like the more we get entrenched in these like oppressive frameworks these very in highly institutionalized frameworks and things like that and I think they have a lot to teach us um about how to organically arrive at these concepts I've noticed that when I as I've gone through this decolonization process I've realized like wow like these are all things I used to be interested in as a kid and, you know, we're now deemed as like, oh, that's weird or things like that, like, right, like wanting to be in nature, wanting to commune with people, wanting to do things collectively, wanting to really like find other ways of communicating and learning and things like that. And yeah, I guess I would just say that, like, it's important to have youth be a part of the conversation to reinvigorate um, these spaces. Anything to add, Addy? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I guess I'll just quickly add, I think um, I think a good sort of metaphor for this is just how a lot of a lot of really young people will see like a person experiencing homelessness on the street and be like, this is not right. Like tell their parents, like we have to do something. And by the time you become an adult, you kind of just pass by people, at least some people do. And I think, you know, with youth, with um, being a young person, it comes with that innate kind of, you know, wanting to like make things right I mean obviously that's not true for all people but I think that um, a lot of young people just are able to have that view of the world that things need to be changed and are able are have the energy to do that so I think we definitely need to be focusing on youth power because that's that's where the future is absolutely I, I wholeheartedly agree with both of you and I'll just add that centering youth experiences and perspectives is essential to cultivating individual and collective autonomy among young people through education, with autonomy arguably serving as one of the most important principles uh, for constructing a truly decolonial educational system and approach. Lauren, I see that you have your hand up. Feel free to go ahead. And Joao, I see your hand as well. I'll come to you next. Oh, I, I asked you to unmute, Lauren. Yes. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm working off of two different systems. Um, I think, uh, Addie, you kind of led into where my question was going or what I was thinking over the course of, by the way, incredible, uh, all three of you, incredible um, information. I, I found myself expanding on on uh, every time you each spoke about your particular topics. I, I, as somebody who's also been in the field of education or concerned about the lack thereof or the thoroughness thereof um, uh, in the programs, and, and we're looking now, or, or I, I see you looking at working with the youth or trying to engage in different stages at the younger age, how is it, um, how do you, how do you see a means and a ways in which to track that, that, that seed that you laid um, to see that, you know, yes, I, 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 we expanded that mind at that age, but how does it mature without us maybe on it you know, watering it every, you know, how, 
and I want you each to know that whatever seeds you drop, they're sown and it's a good thing. But I mean, just that, that ability, that, that tracking mechanism, because I, I think that's what, 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 um, as somebody who also builds programs, I think that that's that one goal that I've never really, you know, thought about until today that, that you look at, you know what I mean? And then that kind of like, you know, clears a lot of the clutter and it, it's, it's a lot more focused. How do you track it? How do you see it? How do you ensure it? Or can you? And I, if you, I, how would you? Okay, there I am. I think I got it out, did I? Mm -hmm. I, I think you did, Lauren, and I, I really appreciate this question. I think it's a, it's a crucial one in no small part because if we imagine the enemy of decolonial education as indoctrination, indoctrination is an enemy that is constantly fighting back. Um, it, it, if someone remains static in their decolonial learning, then they have a good chance of being subjected to indoctrination in one form or another. It can intervene before they have a chance to fully develop their decolonial worldview. This is precisely why decolonial education has to be an ongoing process. Sorry about the noise in the background. I don't know if you can hear it. Uh, Kier, would you like to respond to this vital question to begin with? Yeah, so... I know that when, and this is something that like I'm starting to think through too. Actually, <laughs> I actually asked Pratik if um, he would like apply with me to like this research grant on like education to kind of see like how we can think through tracking it in like the least like testy way. Like, <laughs> I don't want to be giving people tests. Like, um, but like, I feel like the way that I've kind of seen it like through working with kids over like say like over a year which like most of the students like are with us for more than one year um is you know first of all you know just asking the basic questions can be like a super simple survey like our google form like like how do you understand like in our case like environmental justice and like what is your familiarity bup, 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 bup. and you know and asking them to like like write out answers or like verbally kind of like discuss it or tell it to us um kind of having different methods for like um inputting answers to um but like i think also as you start to do more of more of this like education work you can also kind of see it because as students are forced like Four sounds like such a bad word to use, but like, I guess like you're like giving them information, right? And then you're asking them to not just like absorb that for the, you know, just to absorb it or to like regurgitate it, but to like actually like implement it um, as they're learning it. And then like towards the end, like when they have some sort of like project slash that, right, by the way, like in a classroom is only the first stepping point, then we always encourage them to join our organizing program to then be like, okay, so you start, you have the seeds of this right now, you have this emotional sensitivity, um, you have um, all these basic tools, which I always um, reference the Hungerford and Volk um, piece um, that was published in the 90s, um, as they have like a whole framework for like how environmental at what causes people to or what catalyzes people to action um is like the environmental sensitivity it's the it's the knowledge sharing it's the understanding what are the systems at play right which like again you would think 90s like people are talking about this stuff but yeah they were um and then it's like okay but then most education um setups are always missing that final piece, which is what they call the empowerment variable, which invariably is in our name, even though we didn't like, we didn't know about this research before. Um, but yeah, it's like about then understanding, then walking with that student and understanding, okay, how do we go from point A to point B, right? What are the things that are blocking us in our current context? What are the resources we have at our disposal? And how can you build that community around yourself or support a ready pre-existing community to get that um that stuff done right and so it's then getting their little minds to work and start thinking through that and like holding their hand at least at the beginning but then you know once once they're once they're going they're gone like I would say that 
like again I think I think once you kind of take them out of this this rigid sense of like schooling of like this is the way it has to be done um like you can be like no like literally do however you think it's done we just have to get to this end point which is it does it does it involve community did you um make sure that you're not like kind of recreating any wheels that are already created in your community right have you thought about like the systems of oppression are you recreating those systems of oppression through your actions right those are the only rigid frameworks that I would say we have. But other than that, you're able to, to create and troubleshoot and make mistakes. And I think that's why it's really important to then work with students for more than just like a semester, right? Because I think a lot of this deep-seated root, root work, um, it, it doesn't take, like you can't unlearn in like just a couple months, like, right? Like it, like you've been indoctrinated technically since you like started going to school or even maybe before that, right? By your own parents. So like, I think also what we've ended up doing is like, you know, we'll ask students to like keep like little diaries or like track or like, you know, like kind of have little like check-ins and little like um, presentations, however they choose. Um, and, you know, usually by the end of it, usually like, um, you know, usually, you know, community slash government slash press is already like on them because they're doing a fabulous, fabulous work. So like, we never really have to like, follow along too hard towards the end but it's like very apparent that the, the end result um but I think that, that that initial stuff yeah it's definitely a little bit more um not hand-holding but um loving lovingly mentoring and and pushing <laughs> but yeah no I I think that you're highlighting the need to strike an effective balance between support and trust, um, giving students the scaffolding they need to do the work that you'd like them to do and that they'd like to do, but also giving them the space they need to do that work as they understand it and as they see the need to do it. Addie, would you like to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, I feel like for, for the case of Vasarn, it's a little bit harder because we literally go into a classroom for 30 minutes and then that's it. But we do um, leave books and materials with the classroom. So hopefully their learning continues over the course of the year. Um, so it's hard to see like, it's hard to see the end result, but I, th I think our hope and our goal is that we will see the end result in a better state, in a better society when these students grow up and become teachers or whatever they end up doing and they come at it with an anti-racist mindset and more just understanding of these topics. So I think we, we, we can, we're hoping that it makes a difference in the future. Um, in terms of like older kids, we do send out like some surveys and stuff kind of like here was saying, um, and we like, not like tests, but like just kind of talking through what their thoughts are and what they're experiencing and things like that. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's the main way that we are able to see progress. Um, and also just through like asking them questions and like like trying to understand where their comprehension is. Um, and again, like by leaving resources in their classrooms and with their teachers, we hope that like in the future, they'll continue that conversation and continue talking about it so that it becomes more ingrained and not just, oh, these students came in and talked to me about this for 30 minutes. Now I forgot. We're hoping that it like continues and that we're able to see like something come from it. I just had a crazy idea come up uh, is that uh, you uh, partner with the uh, PTAs for the PTA or the PTSO for the state so that you actually have access to all of the schools and then they would just, you know, ensure that your resources are throughout the entire system, wherever there's a, you know, you get somebody to donate and, and make sure that they can get your resources to each and every school and, um, you know, partner and offer it through the PTA. And that's an organization that'll keep it going because they're in the schools. There's a child in that school, your PTA is going to be there and it's a, a way to keep it moving toward forward. I 
I, I saw you responding with a resounding yes in the chat, Addy. Would you like yeah. to expand upon that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a, a really good idea. We um we work with the Vermont Principals Association and like the Vermont School Boards Association to like distribute resources, but I think that that is a really good suggestion. And we've like had parents like because um a lot of the lessons at the beginning were virtual because it was during COVID. Um, and a lot of parents like would sit in and like you know, give us feedback and say like what they thought. And um, I think it's difficult sometimes with like parents because not or they're not always on the same wavelength in terms of that kind of stuff. But I think that's a really good suggestion. And we would definitely look into that. Absolutely. Um, I, I think you're all pointing the need for this work to extend beyond students and teachers alone for it to be um, a form of community engagement in the truest sense to be effective. I will at the same time say that I'm glad that you've had relatively positive experiences working with school boards and parent-teacher associations, Addy. Uh, I, I was speaking earlier about you know, the wave of reaction speaking, uh, sweeping across this country in the field of education, you can very much see that at the school board level. Um, Republicans have gone out of their way to plant themselves on school boards for the purposes of reversing educational progress. Um, so I would say, even though I'm not, I, I very much favor grassroots mass organization over electoralism, that we have to intervene at the level of the school board as well. Joao, you've had your hand up for a while and I would like you to have the chance to ask your question. Please go ahead. Hi. Well, uh, first, uh, I think uh, it's adequate to say from where I am doing this question, like, uh, well, other than how what do I do for it? I live in Chiapas, in San Cristobal de las Casas. And uh, I'm also nowadays uh, working and helping with the Lagering magazine. That is the, the magazine helped by the Kurdish movement for the Youth World Confederalism. Just, um, I heard it, uh, what you said and I'm, first of all, I'm very impressed. I would like to say that because uh, the way, the creative ways that both of you are, are trying to make a co coherence during this process is very impressive. But at the same time, I would like to, understanding that the reality is contrad contradictory I would like to heard because like uh, you, as I heard, you are trying to find autonomy in, in like the, the breaks of the institutional state education and how you can get out students from these places and try to create more a communi communitarian way of learning. At the same time, uh, mainly in some moments, uh, I think there is a very small limits that I would like to heard. How are you dealing with that? That is the cooptation of those youth people who are getting into all this knowledge of uh, participatory the participatory leadership of decision critical decision thinking and uh, how to how to get into a community know how to talk with the community uh, but inside an in a system where they they can be cooptated to simulate this kind of logics to to represent some strategic power groups by NGOs or by uh, entering in, the, in some political parties and some systems that could do the double, like a, 
can use everything that uh, are learning to other things. So how are you dealing with this contradictory process of trying to do this education, trying to keep rooted those people, knowing that um, mainly like a Democratic Party and uh, other, other key actors could be looking into this process to try to cooperate those individuals who can use all those tools to do to to keep a way of maintaining the system. I think this is yet another really important question. If I understood you correctly, compañero, um, you're asking about the the limitations of cultivating autonomy within a state-controlled educational system, especially with regard to the persistent danger of co-optation by the powers that be, even if they present themselves as progressive. ¿Es correcto? ¿Es tu pregunta? Bien, bien. Um, Kier, would you like to, to kick off the responses? Yeah, so, I mean, so again, like, I will not say that we're at the goal of decolonization. I say we're just at the beginning. Um, so don't get me wrong. Um, while I do recognize critiques, I was also referring to us as well. Um, I think that, you know, I'm always in the process of learning. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, thank you for that, right? Um, because I think it is important to always, like, think about. So, where we first started was Alexi and I didn't see this type of these types of concepts talked about in classrooms, so we decided to create it. Right, and that was it. Like we didn't have this whole like, woo, we're gonna change the world, liberation type of mindset. We kind of just like as um, Addie was mentioning, like you know, both of us being people of color, not seeing like ourselves represented in schools, and then all of a sudden we found ourselves with like the ability to have a real impact. Um, a real long-term impact on these like students. So I didn't mention this in the challenges, um, but now that you mention it, it you know it is really timely that you that you put this question out because I think something that currently I am working on, struggling with, I'm um, being challenged by is this, um, and I believe somebody in the chat mentioned it. Oh yeah, Mara, like about like. Um, right-wing media, but I just want to talk about like just media too in general, I think has really um, skewed the way that youth view success. A lot of youth view success as, oh, I am going to get a picture that is going to be posted on a website. Oh, I am going to speak at the UN. And like I mentioned, like that's kind of like, so for like the youth at, at like whenever they decide or, or you know, decide to end our um, programming or decide to like continue with us, whatever, we're very open and reflexible to their own timing, right? And we're also acknowledge their own sense of agency in what they choose to do, right? But um, more and more over the years, I have kind of noticed that, right? Like how like you will teach youth the right words to use, but they might fall into those same pitfalls of then co-opting that terminology, right? So currently what I'm trying to do is trying to also build deep, more deep seated relationships with a lot of like the youth like organizations and, and things like that um, and trying to work from the inside out. Because I think, especially I'm gonna speak from New York City, for example, Fridays for Future, um, you can look them up. They have a really big website. If you heard of Greta Thunberg, um, you know, that's one of the chapters, right? I mean, that or I don't think the youth understand how powerful being a part of that org is because literally every single environmental justice org government everybody is like paying attention to that org and you know i i, I don't want to understate like their power but you know essentially they they do a march every year and then they stop the march and then that's it right but it's like that power that energy could be used for so much it could be used so much more critically um if if, if they kind of um, maybe switch their energy from just like, it has to be so big and we have to get these press and we have to get all this like media attention on us to something maybe that's a little bit more like, okay, yes, it's okay that we can have all this attention, 
but we should also be thinking about okay how to also like take back the narrative how to kind of point to what we want them to focus on like right like they may focus on us but we have to point them to things that actually like matter in terms of creating material change and then also how do we protect um the things that we've done how do we protect this knowledge that we've been able to learn from like you know these outside forces so i would say definitely in the belly of the beast specifically the united states it is definitely um something that currently i am like struggling with and i'm thinking about all the time that's actually like the next kind of phase for what i wanted to do um but yeah it's definitely something that i'm thinking about and i think a lot of that again is going to go back to to youth kind of really showing them hey this is kind of the end goal of what has happened to other movements other types of like things throughout history this is kind of what happened when like this was allowed to happen maybe can we think of ways to be proactive about it right and how do we and how do we all maintain accountability to each other around that um so yeah I hope it wasn't a more complete answer because I'm still thinking through it but I hope it was an answer feel free to go ahead Addy yeah I mean I would agree I I want to make sure like I don't talk too long so we give other people a chance to ask questions but I think you know, it's it's difficult because we're trying to make change in a system um, like that is, there's a lot of things wrong with the system. And like, it's hard to make little changes and be like, oh, does that actually like impact everything? And I think, especially with the school system, like, oh, just reading books on race to kids, like, that doesn't change the structure of how schools work and how like all of these um, systems are just oppressive. And, um, but yeah, I think one thing Vasarn has did in the past is we actually met with a right-wing group and we, um, because we were interested in hearing their perspective because we were working on legislation that they were against. Um, so we talked to them and, I mean, it was an interesting conversation. We didn't agree with them, but I think we all we all are human. And I think that you have to get on that level sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't think that really answered the question, but just some thoughts. Thank you for that measured response, Addy. I I admire you for having more patience with right with right wingers than I usually do. Um the the uh, like my my obscenities tend to start flowing as soon as I see them, um, <laughs> and I I will say um, as a point of praxis that we should be wary of normalizing their viewpoints. A lot of the time, that is precisely what they they want. In my personal opinion, fascism cannot be debated; it can only be smashed. Um, Folks, we are officially at the end of this session. However, like I've said in the chat, I'm personally open to extending the conversation by five to 10 minutes, um, if that is first and foremost okay with Kier and Addy, and of course, with everyone else on this call right now, at least folks who are willing to stay for a little longer. I'd certainly like to give Archana a chance to ask a question. I saw your hand up just a few minutes ago. Are, are folks, at least folks on the call right now, okay with going for a few more minutes? All right, uh, over to you, Archana. Thank you so much, Pratik. Um, um, I think it's been a very nourishing and very rich session because to hear from the generation that is going to take this whole thing forward is very, very essential. But there are a few things that I'm that has been a huge challenge. I work in India. I work with indigenous communities. I work with the young people, and we are basically co-creating this intergenerational indigenous learning spaces, which basically honors the traditional wisdom of these communities so that the roots are not lost. But at the same time, how can we create contextual environment for the young people so they don't feel isolated from the rest of the world? Right? That's very important. But the two things that one, we have been uh, really trying to work with is one is this deep rooted conditioning 
that not just the young people, but their extended families, the peer, the community has, right? And how do you basically challenge this deep-rooted conditioning that they have? Because any child who is going to be interested in coming over here is like the first question I even, I hear it from everybody, even the people who are out there, the most educated who've been exposed and exploring all kinds of systems. And they say, oh, but what is the future of a child like this, you know, who's only going to be rooted in their own thing? And I'm like, you know what? Do you understand the future of a child who's not rooted into their community, but also lose their place in the world? Because every time a young person moves away from the community, a part of the culture dies with them, right? And that way, many cultures are becoming extinct. And that way, we are losing a whole treasure trove of knowledge. So one, how do we tackle that conditioning also through the kind of work that both of you are doing, right? It's very essential. And I would have really loved to speak to the third person who's not here on the panel. And I was so excited to listen to his point of view because he's working in the heart of Africa, right? And so essential. The second thing is that I think colonization did not just, you know, shift the entire spectrum of so many things for the continent which were colonized, but I think it corrupted our narratives of what we know today and how we know it. And as a result, we are just battling with things which are superficially available to us, but it has also corrupted our narratives of what do we believe about our own selves, right? And how do we basically establish that out there? Like who calls Africa and Asia uh, developing nations on what parameters and on what uh, you know, benchmarks? Is it just GDP? Is it just money? But what about when it comes to knowledge, the wisdom, the richness of cultural ethnicity that is like pouring out of every atom of this particular con, these content, Latin America. Like I work at the intersection of these three continents and the kind of knowledge that is there, who was there on uh, the previous session I was a part of? And I think you girls should look at her aloha of pedagogy, because a lot of it was, she works with young people in Hawaii and it's beautiful what the work she's doing. So Ecoversity has beautiful projects across continents. But these are two questions that I've been struggling with because we really want, and it works at intergenerational level. It does not work at any any one spectrum, no. So if, if this is something you have come across or if this thought has occurred, I would really love to hear what your perspective on it is. Um, th those are two rather profound questions, especially to address in the next five minutes or so that we've allocated to wrap up this meeting. Uh, if I could try to synthesize those questions, and please let me know if uh, I'm off base with this. You're asking about how like, colonized people can effectively navigate modernity, that is, preserve what is liberatory about their traditions whilst still having at least one foot in the modern world. And I think that very much goes hand in hand with what you're saying about the colonial corruption of um, personal and collective narratives. Uh, if that is a sensible way of, of synthesizing your, your questions, Archana, I'll invite Kier and Adi to respond to that combined question. Basically, how should colonized people navigate modernity um, when you know neo-colonialism and neo-imperialism are constantly corrupting the their narratives about themselves and their communities? Addy, do you want to go first since I've been going first? Sure. Free, uh, yeah. Um yeah, I mean, I guess I'd I'd start with saying. I think that's a very real issue. I think the perspective that I have on it coming from Vermont is that Vermont is a very not diverse state. Um, we It's like 94% white, I think. Um, and a lot of those like white students come into it with a very, like they're, they get perspectives from their parents, from the media that are kind of rooted in racism. Um, so we have to, go into classrooms and like try to address that um and we try to just introduce these topics in a way that is understandable and we also try to work with parents too like sometimes we send parent letters home to like try to get them into the conversation so that like it's it's not just a thing that falls on the student it's like the whole family um is able to have these conversations and I think that that 
really helps. Um, and I think also like, it's just, it's just important to, to celebrate, I think, um, different, like differences. And I think that that's a really important thing to do with young people, um, so that they understand that, like, like that pushing back against these mindsets that society gives us is a good thing. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question, but that's kind of what I was thinking, but Kira, what would you add? Um, yeah. So, I mean, to your second question, um, um, Archana, or sorry, is your first name India? <laughs> oh no, or is, is that your place? Okay, that's your, that's where you're coming from. Okay. <laughs> Um, also in the United States, there are some people named India, so I you know, like always have to ask. Um, so yeah, so well, first to your second point, um, I really like what Michael um, Parenti has to say around, you know, that the that actually it's the global north that's underdeveloped because literally the global south and all the resources literally help to develop the global north. So if we're actually talking about any sort of development, like. <laughs> I really feel like development, like the, the the ability to develop or like whatever we're defining as that, like was stolen from like the global north and literally just boop, pushed up to the global north. So like, I usually start there with students. So like, you know, just technically, like, I don't really have a problem like explaining that to them. I think also, I will say that, you know, I am working in like New York and not Vermont or not like Florida, you know, which it had passed a lot of this, like, crazy um, legislation around not being able to talk about these things as openly. Obviously, there's still barriers in New York City, but I would definitely say that, you know, we 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 are a little bit more fortunate. Um, I think to the other point of, of, of you kind of like mentioning um, how, how do we kind of, you know, be attentive to where students are are situated in this in time and space um within our world but then also right as Pratik kind of summarized like also wanting to kind of maintain ties to like cultural um spiritual like customary what have you um ties uh for me personally, I always work from a dialectic point of view. I don't really try to like have like a generalized way of, of, of teaching. And I think that in itself is decolonial. Like it has to be place-based. Um, so like, I would say like, first I start there. Second of all, you are totally right. Um, you know, it's not just what students are learning at school. It's also the other types of education that they're receiving from their parents and the community. So, I mean, number one, my, my, always my response is, is that uh, at least in the United States, I don't know about in India, in your context, I would love to learn more about that. So like, please let's keep in touch. Um, I put my email in the chat. Um, in the United States though, students actually spend a lot of their lifetime in classrooms <laughs> and like, that's wild. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to work in classrooms, even though there's so many barriers, even though it's so institutional, if we can get access to students there and get them out in the streets, uh, the way I see it, the more the better, right? So like, first of all, I would say, I think that is a little bit understated, at least in American society, where it's like students, once you give them the space to think critically apart from their parents, I mean, that's what happens when students go to college too. Like that's how like students get progressive or radical. It's like they're away from their parents to have their own time to think for themselves. Um, and that's usually where a lot of that growth happens, um, and so, at least within our culture and our society. So I would, so what I always just say to like people who are like, "Oh my gosh, do you have any trouble?" I'm like, "No," because once you kind of show the facts to students, like, like we'll use like examples of where they come from, from right? Like I'll always ask, "Where are you coming from? Where are your or family's origins, your origins, things like that?" Okay, let's bring that into the classroom. Let's talk about it. Let's engage with it, right? How does it like compare or contrast to like other people, right? And obviously that's gonna develop over time with more trust um, and with more understanding, right? But that is always like the basis, right? Um, and then lastly, I would say, you know, also doing like food programs, like being attentive to the holistic student. I, I feel like parents have nothing to complain about. And like, for the most part, they're like, yes, give me more resources. 
And you know, the more they're willing to be like, oh my gosh, like my student talks about you or like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Like then like I use that as a way to like have those conversations with them. And usually it's coming from fear, right? Or like, or fear-based place of like, okay, like, but if my student does this, like, will they be able to like, um, like take care of themselves or like, will they be able to like, you know, cause you know, a lot, of, especially talking to like immigrant families or things like that, right. Or low-income working class families, right. Like, are they going to be able to like take care of themselves? I don't want them to live the same, like, I don't want them to struggle the way that I struggled. Right. Um, and so that's like the second part, which I didn't really talk about, which is like, this more is like the nonprofit more like official or the organization part, which is like, okay. But like on the side, I'm also working with a lot of community groups to like actually try to create communities of care. Like, what does it look like to establish food systems outside of like going to the chain stores? Like, how do we like distribute like tools and tool libraries and like um, uh, time banks and things like that, other forms of like exchange within communities? Because that is actually already happening in New York City. It just needs to be scaled a little bit more um, to kind of support a community. And so like, that's where like that also revolutionary decolonial process is, right? And that's where like, I don't want students to stay within classrooms. I want them to also get out there and help me with that work. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say that it's never like, it's never gonna be like a super simple answer, but that's why I think it's so important to develop relationships, not only with the students, but with like their communities and like with like their circles outside of the classroom. Much love and blessings, everyone. Uh, we, we skipped in and I, I, I really don't like to interrupt intellectual discourse because it is just so stimulating. What were we doing before we started thinking? Huh? But uh, however, and it's a must that I inform you that the, if anybody is interested in attending and normally hangs out at the cafe after, it's been open for the last 15 minutes and I think it'll go for like another 15. So if that's where you de-escalate de after your day, hanging out here in these sessions and whatnot, I want to guide you in that direction. If you must leave, leave, okay? We're here. Uh, here, there were two questions that I copy and pasted into notes for you. Uh, Ale, Ala, Osman, Osman. If you would leave your email address I will cut and paste that and forward your questions over to Kira at or, or she can snatch it up and 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 uh, and respond in kind. Is that fair to ask? Wonderful. I'm guessing that that silence is golden as I, I would believe it to be. Email is in there. There you go. All yeah. right. I also want to definitely take the time to extend um uh to the panel, uh, an incredible, incredible time with you. It, um, your passions are quite obvious. Your actions have been far. Your knowledge on your on your on your, on your subject uh, and um, your ability to keep us engaged and keep elevating us every time you offered additional words and advice or spoke on your experiences or even your opinions was incredibly enlightening. And I think that we all feel um, we have a better sense of what we could possibly do and where to go and who to help if we want to get something done. And for that, I really do appreciate you and all of your time and all of your efforts. It was a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing. Uh, I, I, that doesn't mean that there it couldn't be one last question, maybe, or, or one sentence that goes across the board, or... We just, you know, uh, take this moment to just, you know, do like a little self shoulder hug and uh, and move on to the cafe and and just mix and mingle and deescalate because uh, there is a tomorrow and a little bit more to go. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I, I I would encourage folks to migrate to the cafe while it lasts. Uh, we've actually extended this meeting past the, the 10 minutes that we said we would. I know we can keep going, but I, 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 I'm I actually in favor of ending on that very wholesome note, Lauren. Um, thank you for your assistance. Thank you for your mm -hmm. questions. Thank you for your words of encouragement. And thank you everyone for being here. And of course, a huge thank you 
to Kier and Adi for sharing their excellent work. Keep fighting all the good fights, folks. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Much love. Take care. I'll be in Bye. touch. Else. <laughs>